I'm an only child. I had a great childhood. I have two amazing parents that uh, gave me everything I needed. I thought I could fly when I was young. <laughs> I mean, we were poor, but it was so much love that we didn't really notice. We grew up in an environment where you never really knew what was going to happen, and that creates a lot of uncertainty. Compared to previous generations, OK, we might be a bit skint, we might not be able to afford the best pair of shoes, but we're not living in poverty. We make plenty of money. Like, we make plenty of money. It's not like we won the lottery and moved into a big, fancy neighborhood. My integrity is what I have. You know, a long time ago, people's word and their integrity meant a lot. I grew up happy in the Appalachian Mountains. We had good Christmases. We had love. I was normal. But now, <laughs> what the hell am I now? Can you hear me? No challenge is more urgent. We can either settle for a country where a shrinking number of people do really well, while a growing number barely get by. Or we can restore an economy where everyone gets a fair shot and everyone does their fair share and everyone plays by the same set of rules. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. It is time to reawaken this industrial giant to get government back within its means and to lighten our punitive tax burden. On these principles, there will be no compromise. Can you tell us what's happening? Are you going back to work or not? All out war by the council workers. Another industrial dispute, this time the lorry drivers, has led to some panic buying in the shops and markets. It felt that whatever the government tried to do, it wasn't necessarily making things better, it might be making things worse. I did think that the free market would produce the resources that could make everybody better off. The argument was that if you did these things, uh, we will get rid of unemployment, there'll be more investment, there'll be more income, that will trickle down. Hey, five aids for 100,000 tons of water. Without big rewards, people like me are not going to work uh, 15 to 20 hours a day in order to get rich. <laughs> graduate school, my doctoral years, I was told psychologists five to ten years into practicing on average were making a hundred thousand dollars a year and I was like, that sounds awful. And that was like kind of like my incentive to be like the top one percent. I'm not in the top one percent in terms of the world, it, it's maybe in just the psychology world. I choose this, I choose to drive. I could take a train in directly into the city. I just feel like that's one extra time that I could get sick, being in an enclosed area with lots of strange, you know, in the, in the public. It's like, I don't, I can't afford to be sick at this point in my career. I, I, every day counts while I'm trying to save for this house. Got 10 minutes to make it to work with coffee in hand. Get my coffee with espresso shot in it, my red eye, and I walk directly to my office, usually here five minutes to 11, and turn on the lights here, sit down, and I go bang, 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 one session after the next. It's nonstop, it's not like I leave, I can't leave this little box of an office. I don't have anyone to talk to. Like, I never need to leave the building other than to get lunch, which I pray to do every once in a while to get to sit alone at a counter at a diner across the street 
And that to me, reading the New York Post, is heaven. My day starts on Sunday and doesn't end until the following Friday. Because once Monday hit, I'm up every day, every day, just like this. It's a constant battle. Everything creates a little bit of stress. I'm gonna tell y'all one more time. Don't come in that door no more. Shut the door! <sighs> when I get in real stress mode, I might smoke about four or five cigarettes. I don't know. But you can't drink on your job. Because <laughs> if that was the case, I'd have a flask at work. We have potato wedges or green beans or sweet loose corn or macaroni and cheese. Okay, um, um, there's something that said. Sweet loose corn, macaroni and cheese, potato wedges, or green beans. Okay. And what else got with mashed potatoes? Uh, look! Can you make up your mind what you want? I'm trying to help you. <laughs> you know, I'm on this end now. Help me. Please. We're doing okay. Okay, I know the little slight interruptions. I know y'all bleep them out if you can. <laughs> in Sunderland, over one in four men are unemployed. The further 600 sackings were announced last week. Income differences started widening rapidly from the mid 80s onwards. The weaker trade unions are, the more inequality there is. It's a very striking relationship. Today's unemployed are the victims of yesterday's mistakes. But that's the past. The government's getting inflation down, interest rates down, reforming trade union law, cutting regulations and moving restrictions. The balance of power between employers and employees shifted in favour of employers. I think that happened, and I think it was a deliberate result of policy. He'll be in bed when I go to work in the morning. Then he'll probably be in bed when I come in from work at night. And if he's not, I'll not be... If he's up, I'll be going straight to bed anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got to go, down. Oh, it's a shame for the kids. They might still be in bed when I go to work, and then when I come home, they're back to bed. And I know it just bores the life out of them because they can't do much. Within the home care sector, zero hours are just the way it works. I just don't know what might happen from week to week, day to day. Piranha porridge, John, don't eat it just yet. Let it cool okay, down, you? Yeah, you understand that slowly, thank you. You're right there. And we have your tablet. Yeah. If somebody dies or somebody goes into hospital, it, it's awful, but you think to yourself because you're going to lose a lot of hours if 
if you don't get something to fill that gap. Anything else I can do for you while I'm here? No, that's fine. Hello. Thanks again. Thanks. I'll, um, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. I'm probably going to be a bit late tomorrow, mind it's Saturday. Not to worry. Right. Yeah. The way services are commissioned out, people are seen as units for sale, sold to the lowest bidder. Half an hour to get somebody up, get them washed, get them dressed, give them the meds, and have a meaningful conversation. It doesn't work. How long have you got for this one? I'm going to be 20, 20, 25 minutes in here. That's OK. People look on your own. Oh, is that all you do? No, no, it's not all I do. I'm not just a carer, I'm a carer. You! We had went to where my husband was from, and we had decided we were, you know, gonna um, have our, you know, have our own business and everything. And, and that was, you know, where we started. We had, we had a, so we bought a video store. And when Walmart got in the video business, it really just killed it for the mom and pop stores. You know, we didn't have the volume of uh, what Walmart would have. So um, after five years, we ended up closing it. I was in the Walmart one day, and they had a sign um, they were hiring, and I thought, well, you know, I'll go put an application in. And when they called, I was really surprised, and I was even more surprised how good of a company it was to work for. Any extra effort you put forth, they appreciated it. The managers would just come and say, I saw what you did, and hey, that, you know, thank you. Until the changes came. The uh, focus of the company went to cutting operational expenses. Less people to do the work, but yet the same amount of work. You have to get to work soon. Oh, I don't know what time it is. Oh, two o'clock, and I think I go at four today. No, at 3.30, today's the fourth. You see, every day you're like, what time do I go to work? Don't you think that is just nerve-wracking? I don't know my nose. And I'm not the only one. I've talked to people across the country and they do the same thing, you know? They're just like, what time do I go to work tomorrow? You would not believe how much stress that puts in your life. We are living through a moment of absolutely astonishing transformation. All of you know that the information and technology explosion will offer to you and to the young people of the future more opportunities and challenges than any generations of Americans has ever seen. It's a stock market boom not seen since the heady years of the 1980s. The Dow Jones Index up by almost a quarter in just 12 months, with record profits and million dollar bonuses appearing in paychecks once again. What's really changed is that if you were once the CEO of a company, your company served a local market. Now most markets that are important are global in scope. If you're the CEO of Apple Computer and you make the company 3% more efficient than it would have been, you've added $1.2 billion to the company's bottom line. Your economic value has just grown explosively. We're really pleased to report that this quarter we earned $106 million. Bill Gates of Microsoft is now worth $29 billion, up $10 billion. Gordon Moore of Intel Computers, $6.7 billion, up $3 billion. And Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard, a personal fortune of $4 billion, up a $1 billion, all in just six months. If you end up at the top of this process, 
then you do have a justification for what's happening to you. The market is an efficient way of allocating resources. It's allocated a lot of resources to me, and that me must be an efficient result. It must show that I'm hardworking and clever and, in quotes, deserve what I'm getting. Very few people have the mental resources, the energy. I mean, look, look at me. Here I am. I'm creating an African art collection. I'm creating companies. My youngest child is three. I'm 70 years old. I have four children, 13 and below. So what does that say about me? I mean, I'm out there creating. There are a lot of things that perpetuate inequality. Economic systems, governments, policy. One of the things, I would argue, is also psychology. How people think, the kinds of things that they value. Inequality is rising, but people aren't aware of what they're doing to contribute to that. Most of the gated communities are either on a golf course or are golf course adjacent. Some of the amenities are really great, really great. But for some people, really it is about living behind a gate. Well, I live behind a gate, and you do not live behind a gate. And look at how much better it is that I live behind a gate. Buddy. We didn't buy this house to one-up our friends who didn't buy a house behind the gate. But we had a lot of friends that really thought we did. We had friends that were like, no, we won't come and visit. We won't come and see you. We won't. Kind of that you moved over there, we moved over here. <clears throat> it's really sad. It's really sad. In general, everyone pretty much keeps to themselves. Do you no. want the bananas for your no. hamburger sandwich? No. no. We don't know anything about our neighbors. I eat nothing. I found another hamburger. One of the things that for a couple of our neighbors has really bent them out of shape is that we haven't hired a gardener. So this neighbor comes out and stares at me, visibly pregnant, raking leaves. It's just staring. And he yells from across the street. You know only poor people, only, only poor people rake their own leaves. How excited are you to... Take that, Jaguar. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> How excited are you to see the house? I'm very excited. I think this community is gonna be like more young people that are like us. So it's like, I'm gonna meet a whole new crew of uh, young dads who are gonna wanna play football and, and softball with me and tennis and, and stuff. And I feel like this is the best community that we could ever have wanted. It has everything. It has the great school district. I yep. mean, I think we really lucked out. Greg was even talking to someone the other day and he was like, it's like a place where there's tennis courts, there's a pool, there's a guard gate, there's like, you know, there's a lot of young people, and he goes, oh, it must be Boulder Ridge. And Greg goes, yeah, that's it. So it's like a well-known, there's like, it's, this is like a diamond in the rough place. This is like the best place in Westchester. That's amazing. Yeah. Everyone bases where they live around schools. We're gonna be sending our girls to a school in Ardsley, one of the top school districts in the nation. And it's gonna be a great quality of life and a great environment with great future families to meet. And, and I think it's going to be funny because I'll end up finding a lot of Wall Street characters living there. Hello, Holden. Hi, how are you? Good, how Thank are you? Thank you. Good to see you again. Good to see Hi, you. Man. Hello, Seema. Right. I met in these gated communities people who just say, you know, Rich, I just want my kids to attend safe schools. I just want my property values to stay stable. I just want uh, the beautiful amenities of life, private parks, private bike paths, private lakes. And so they're not so aware of the way privilege works on their behalf. What are we going to see first? OK, so we're now in uh, Boulder Ridge. 
We're in Boulder Ridge. It's a large community with hundreds of homes. It has a, a gatekeeper 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. so nobody can enter here without it being known who they are. Right. That means that it's crime-free. That's great. I, and it make me feel safe when I go on my speeches out of town to know that Simba and the girls are protected. Exactly. Nice cars here. Mm. <laughs> I think this is the perfect place for you. Mm. Once you reach a certain tax bracket, there's this expectation that you will just kind of keep up whatever the appearance of the tax bracket is. Cars are a big deal. Most people drive a Mercedes or a BMW, or if they do drive an American car, it is the newest possible version of whatever. We drive BMWs. It's not that we have decided to drive a 1988 Hyundai. I'm very happy with the fact that my car just rolled 200,000 miles. It means I've taken care of something I paid a lot of money for. That's not what you do here. You buy something, you use it for like six weeks, and then you get rid of it and buy the newest version of whatever the it thing is. People have always been kind of obsessed with wanting things. The car they drive, the clothes they wear, the same way you want to leave your house looking good because people judge you on what you look like or what you're wearing. In this industry, when you're working with high profile executives, athletes, and entertainers, they expect a certain presentation style. So I have to keep up a certain image in their eyes so that they respect me. And value my opinion so you know I, I definitely let my uh, wife help me sometimes with the styles brand names and stuff like that but she seems to be very good at getting me dressed for success but I'm a big believer in that if you dress well every day you actually feel like you're more powerful and you feel like you're more successful and sometimes you can like dress your way to success in essence I've seen people get out of depression just by just looking good. If you look like the guy that's got it all, you become the guy that's got it all. Fake it till you make it. The primary mode of transportation when you're in the neighborhood is a golf cart. Everyone gets to kind of show off their golf cart. And there'll be golf carts with off-road wheels, and there'll be golf carts with lift kits, and there'll be golf carts with kits that you plug onto the front of it to make it look like a Mercedes. People will dump ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 into a golf cart. Most Americans are fair-minded and they won't say, I'm going to a gated community to flee brown people. Most people don't think like that. They're simply saying that the perceived sense of safety, the higher property values, that's why I'm moving to these communities. It has nothing to do with race. And so there, there's a divide and that's how you segregate a community. Those who aren't perceived to fit in are not accepted. People who did not golf, people who did not go to a certain church, those types of people often felt excluded. Nope, we're not gonna go, no, hey, hands. Thank you. I appreciate this very good listening. When Max was little, where we lived before, there was a park at the end of the street. The kids would all play together and everyone had a good time together and all of this. You know, that's not the way it is here. Okay, up onto the curb. 
We, at least ethnically, look like the vast majority of our neighborhood. And I still have not come to terms with the fact that my kids are perceived as the different ones. Not too near the swings. I don't need you to get kicked in the head today. <laughs> I have perfectly normal looking, blonde head, blue eyed, nice kids. And this girl ran in fear, screaming, from Max at the playground, just ran. And she kept screaming it at him, how horrifying he was. And her mom was like, yep, it's okay, honey, I know. Something is wrong with this dynamic. If my totally normal kid cannot make a friend at the playground. There has been more than one day that I've called Ryan just in tears. I think I can't take my kid to the park. New York is booming with conspicuous consumption very much back in fashion. The luxury car dealerships can hardly remember a time like it. Do you believe that uh, an individual can earn too much money? What, you mean that, that we should sort of cap someone's income? Hmm. Not really, no. Why? What's the point? What we know has happened is that People at the top of the income ladder have gotten all the income gains that have occurred during the last 30 years. People in the middle of the income distribution, they've run down their savings, they've run up much more debt. Every conceivable margin you can work just to hold your place in the queue. You can borrow up to 1,000 pounds for up to 31 days. It's the perfect way to help manage your short-term cash flow. The government figures released today show a record number of people are insolvent. If you don't pay or contact us within seven days, our collections team may arrange for an agent to contact you and visit your home. The letter's dated the 1st, and it's the 9th today. And when, when, when does she going to come? <laughs> within seven days. Stress, you get on the phone to them. It's November. <gasps> is it, and it's just... Is that how much you owe? Yeah. My catalogue bill is between three and a half, four thousand pounds. But then I use that for stuff that, you know, when the kids need new coats, new shoes, I've got no money left. You've got to, ah, I've got to get it from somewhere. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. I'll give you a ring. Right, I'll see you later, Tom. Bye. Say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. How are you? <laughs> Everything's so much more expensive. And Lutie now, she wants a computer and you feel as though you have to do those things for them because their friends are getting them and they're going to look like the odd one out if they don't get them. Have a cuddle too. Mm. You've got to cut back. <laughs> the school are always on the phone when I've missed the dinner money payments. That happens quite a lot. <laughs> no, no, done. People went from pretty simple financial lives pre-1980 to the point now where people are just totally f submerged in their financial accounts. And they're all in debt. Debt to us might seem, oh, you know, I, I need this loan to, to go to school or I need this loan to buy a house. But to Wall Street, it's just a product that they can buy and sell and package. And so it's just another way for them to get as much profit as they want, and they treat it as such, and they treat it like a game. Hello? I'm at work right now. Can I call you later? But I did make the payment on the third. All right, five, five, four. Thank you, ma'am. All right, you have a blessed day. Bye-bye. All red, third quarter. That crazy. Man, people been giving y'all dollars all weekend, oh, man. Bro, you, 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 I owe a couple of debt companies now, and the only thing I can do is they got to wait in line. I have to pay this for two weeks, and then pay half of the rent, and pay the late fee on that, and just juggle. I gladly pay you Tuesday for a cheeseburger today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's the way it is, man. Hey! Ouch. Hi, y'all! Hey. Hi! There How once was a fella, his pals called him Joe, who said of his bills, there's too much we owe. 
We just need a loan that will last till payday. So they logged on to dollarsdirect.ca. Dollarsdirect.ca is fast and convenient. Just be 18 years or older, have regular employment, and direct deposit. Dollarsdirect.ca. Apply and get cash the same day. One of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit today is how to create a more secure America by achieving the goal of five and a half million new minority homeowners. We certainly don't want there to be a fine print preventing people from owning their home. Once Wall Street figured out that they could create these mortgage products, they were like, wow, this is the deal of the century. We need to make more of these. The house is always the big one. Um, it's the way that the economy is, is set up. Um, you buy a house, housing values tend to go up, and so it's a major component of, of your retirement. And so losing your house, you can find yourself in a position where instead of being able to retire, you're just going to have to continue working. When you go to buy a house, you're really making a bet with hundreds of thousands of dollars that this place is going to hold its value and that everything is going to work out. Houses that fall really drastically behind the trend um, have a really hard time selling. And when they do sell, they sell for less. I think it would be more pressure if we were actively looking to sell our house today. We just try to kind of keep up and make sure that we don't fall really far behind. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, I'm Karen Hobart. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm the owner of Rancho Marietta it's Homes nice and Land Real you. Estate. It's a pleasure. Enjoy. Glad you made it. <laughs> this is listed at $429,900, and it's on a 0.25 of an acre, quarter acre lot. And they have, uh, they've done so many upgrades, it's, it's basically a brand new home, but it was originally built in 1981. What I like about it, watch your step, is they've done all the new laminate flooring. They did not do the windows. So we have yeah. single pane windows, okay. yeah, dual, pane dual pane windows just in this room, but they put yeah, an entire new heating and air conditioning system that was $12,000. Now I have to show you how fantastic these cabinets are. They're, they're the full extension cabinets, all oh, wood, yeah, yeah. and the uh, self-close. With the damper. Hook up for gas. This one does have propane. Hmm. It's copper line. Interesting. And all the houses have a different character and a different style, especially that one. It's very That's a nice looking house. Isn't that one pretty, the Mediterranean? Yeah, it's just got a nice style to it. So this is absolutely one of the best streets in Rancho Marietta. It's nice and it's quiet. It's completely quiet. You'll never really see anybody going by but the people that live here. And the most expensive homes in the neighborhood are down the street yeah. and on the lake. Okay. Well, come on in. Let's see what you think. You are just precious. That first house has, hands down, has the highest per square footage. Yeah, I don't feel like you're getting a lot for by, that. Exactly, by significant margins. But I feel like, at least if you look in comparison to where our home is at, I feel like we're fine. If we did find ourselves in a position where we needed to list the house, we are still, we're just fine. Yeah. More days than not, my first patient would probably be at 11 o'clock, which means that I would get up around 8, get my workout gear on, and go for a run. I'd go running for about 45 minutes to an hour. Loving running outside. I know I push myself but there's really no option other than pushing myself. You know, your back's against the wall when you have to make a mortgage payment. He just had back surgery and he literally worked the next day. Didn't skip a beat, had surgery Wednesday, worked Thursday, Friday, went into the office on Monday. He had a sick day, he couldn't go into the office and make money. So it's important, obviously, that he stays healthy for himself, for our family, and for his clients. 
The government had been collecting data that showed there'd been these huge class differences in life expectancy. And people didn't really believe the data. Even people working in important positions in the health service didn't know whether death rates were highest at the top or the bottom. From cocaine to cat, I mean to capitalistic principle. I try to put my smile back on his face, but I can't get it, so I say a tearful goodbye to all but one of my principles and start conversing with the flow that led me to this slippy road. I wasn't always this way, I guess it started on the day they called the curtains on her casket and she flew away and left me here grounded, cuddling on the truest pain. My biggest ambition in life is trying to get through a day. My mum was 36 when she died. If I keep drinking, that's me. Imagine that, being dead at 36, fuck's sake. All of the things that I need to do to try and lengthen my life, which is already cut short because I was born in Pollock, if I make it to 70, I'll be lucky. And that's if I eat salad every day. Now, of course, because of a growing body of research, people know that unemployment and poverty have health consequences. Uh, instead of the former idea that it was businessman stress uh, that led to the worst health problems. A lot of health problems, everything from high blood pressure to AIDS to hepatitis and all different kinds of diseases around here. Any day above ground is a good day. That's what I've been told. <laughs> Actually, it's what I know, you know, if you can live to see it. My daughter's father passed on the 23rd of last year, so that kind of hurt me a little bit. Back to being a single mother. He died of liver cancer. Yeah, it was really sad. But it is, it's a good thing. You know, I know he's in a better place. He suffered for a while, quite some time. But, yeah, I do, I do. We was together 14 years, long time. In Glasgow, men living in the poorest part have a life expectancy of 54. In India, three quarters of the population live on $2 a day or less. No one in Glasgow lives on $2 a day or less. And yet men in the poorest part of Glasgow have life expectancy that's eight years shorter than the average in India. And I thought, aha, that's it. That's going to explain it being relatively disadvantaged has profound consequences which determine high rates of suicide, violent deaths, alcohol, heart disease. So this is where I had my first um, drink outdoors. It was a Friday night. We came down, what was it? It was old, a bottle of Old Westminster. And uh, it's funny because like, I ended up developing a bit of a taste for a certain brand of fortified wine. <laughs> um, but I remember just thinking, this is disgusting. Why would anybody want to do this? <clears throat> I wish I could become addicted to going to the gym. You know, like... I'll become addicted to fruit. <laughs> I'm addicted to fruit, you know, like phoning my sponsor. <laughs> like, ah, oh man, I went mad on the bananas earlier on. My potassium's out off the chain. <laughs> Alcohol gave me what I thought was confidence. So it's that core belief that you're worth something that I, I'm missing. It was a painkiller for your spirit, really.
everybody is trying to escape in their own way. Youth are trying to escape um, by doing different things like marijuana and stuff like that. Um, Middle-aged people probably drink or do something to escape. Older people probably just don't care because they're old. They don't have to deal with that. So, but everybody's trying to escape something. What do you use to escape? I use my beer, my cigarettes, <laughs> and give me a little beer every now and again, and that's about the size of it. Look at me a good movie and go to bed. Do you have a go-to when you've had a tough day? No, well, actually, ice cream. I like ice cream. And sometimes I'll sit with a pint of that and eat until I can't eat no more, until I'm stuffed. I think you look good with a little meat on your bones. Yeah, it means you're eating good at home. I feel very anxious all the time. And the nervousness is just, even the customers say I don't smile anymore. For example, a man yesterday, he told me, he said, you look like you need to calm down. And I'm like, I can't, you know? He was like, you're gonna have a heart attack. And I'm like, I know. You got to help me. I used to work and I would leave and I would uh, go jogging at the gym and all this kind of stuff and everything and I got to wear it instead. I would rather go, come home and sit down and eat instead, you know. I was walking out and I was like, man, it's been rough because we were so short-handed. I was like, I'm gonna go just go sit in my vehicle and eat some chips till I calm down, you know. But, you know, that's the wrong thing to do. If you take an economics course, you're taught that markets are based on informed consumers making rational judgments. Suppose you turn on the television set and take a look at the ads. I mean, are they trying to create informed consumers making rational choices? On the contrary, they're trying to create uninformed consumers who will act irrationally. And it's a huge industry, one of the biggest industries in the country. Texas Double Whopper, eat like a man, man. People around here are uh, kind of big. Healthy. Yeah, healthy, that's what I'd like to say. Pleasantly plump. Some folk feel like this, some folk feel like that. But, but the way I'm built, I don't you call me fat because I'm built for comfort. Oh, I can't wait until Thanksgiving just seeing that turkey. Because I got a ham and a turkey in there. Yep. But if you really fall, don't worry about it. Go on and... Oh, are you tired? Yes, I am. After I had my daughter, I had congestive heart failure. And I actually literally died. And um, it took me two weeks to come out of the coma. I'm just lucky that my heart still is beating long enough to do what it needs to do, you know, but that's just making it weaker. When did you start getting the high blood pressure? Um, in 2004. Can y'all shut up? Shut up! And shut the door! Shut all the noise up. Everything need to be shut. Everybody need to be sitting down and being quiet. Period. Okay, back to me. <laughs> It just makes me sleep easy at night, knowing if I'm home by myself with my kids, that there's somebody watching over us.
Message skipped. Next message. Message skipped. Next message. That's all. Say I love you, Daddy. I love you. Say goodnight. I like to see you. Sweet dreams. You want to say goodnight to Daddy? I love you, too. I love you, babe. Next message. Message skipped. I would love to see more of Alda. I always say I wish I had a husband that worked a nine to five job, you know, where we were able to come home together at night and take care of the kids together, but I, I know that's not reality. And I know he's providing a lifestyle for us that without him working as hard, we couldn't have. We know that financial distress is one of the main factors that sends people to see marriage counselors. In the areas that saw the biggest increases in inequality, we saw the biggest increase in divorce rates. People in the middle are trying to make ends meet and in the process and experiencing an enormous amount of additional stress in their lives. It's time for bed, little calf, little calf. What happened today that made you laugh? Mommy kissing. After a week, I'm exhausted. I work all day, and then I come home to two kids to feed and bathe and read to and kind of make up for all the hours that I wasn't home during the day. Mm -hmm. I love you. Night-night. That's awful. I feel tremendous guilt not being able to see the girls and put them to bed, and, and it's very frustrating when the girls are more used to her than me. Hi. Hey. How are you? I'm exhausted. How was your day? It was all right. It was fine. It was there? Yeah. Can't I complain. It was up. Oh, God. How are you? I'm good. Ah, honey. Yeah, um, this is our gotcha paper for all the criminals in the neighborhood. So, um, page for page, it tells you who been arrested and what they done did. And sometimes I be looking in here for my son's little friends because I, I don't want none of them to be having no fugitive while I'm, I'm in there cooking. <laughs> That's just from people stressing out because the economy is so jacked up over here. And that's why we end up with situations like these people for different felonies, assaults, and because they're mad and frustrated, can't get a job, or breaking and entering and trying to get in people's houses, or pure rage against another person, wanting what somebody else has. They'll just find anything to take the frustration out on, because they ain't got too much else to do. Psychologists and sociologists who've worked with violent criminals consistently say that lack of respect is the trigger for acts of violence and aggression. All that's left of people is the maintenance of their self-respect, and so if that's threatened in some way, then you see these violent and aggressive reactions. Police in Baker say two teenage boys and a 15-year-old girl died after a gunfight at a birthday party at a privately owned club. This is not unusual. They've had a lot of people killed in this little town in the, in the past few years. High school students killing each other, you know, and, you know, it's, it's... You never know when you're, you know, you're gonna be robbed and... I would love to walk to work or ride a bike to work, you know, because it's only like two miles down the road. But I'm too scared to ride a bike or walk home at midnight. I always worry about walking out of that parking lot, always. So with half the lights out right now, it, you know, it's a very dangerous place. We had 116 homicides last year. Three times the number of people that are in this church. Police and community are trying to address an epidemic of violent crime, much of it rooted in drugs. Street sweeper shotgun. 12 12-gauge 12 rounds in this drum magazine. No sights, because it's not designed to need any sights.
of this Commonwealth. I'm sick of it. I'm stressed out. All this shit is just is just devastating. Look at it. Look at me. Thank you. Keep them around your neck, please. Now she's gone. I don't worry. I'm sitting on I don't trust nothing no more. You know, after this store closed, after it get dark around here, I'm in. I don't care what's out there. I'm I'm good. This war on crime is being waged at every level. Those who can afford it are getting out of the way, retreating to gated, walled estates from where they can watch the new Republican battle for the survival of America. Mr. Hawk. Yes. We're here to visit the Grove Hogs. G R O V H O U G. Steve yeah. Booth. There we go. You guys having a good night so far? Yeah. So far, I had a good day. All right. Thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. See you. Apparently, a neighbor saw it, called us. Apparently, one of his chickens got mauled and another one got. Uh, nipped at and chased around. Was able to, was able to get it mediated with him. Got him calmed down. Um, the coyote siding. Yeah, the coyote siding. Yeah. Did they give you any information about that? Not much. Just that it was crossing the road right up on the north side. Did it sound like it was that big one? It sounded like it was that big one. Yeah. Okay. So maybe he's just getting. He's been hanging over. around for a few months now. I think hasn't he? Sound. I believe so. Yeah. And then we'll uh, the Bass Lake um, pump house. Somebody tossed some rocks through the windows up there. So, oh, okay, so yeah, that's, that's a new one. And there's that uh, other loose dog that we're talking about. Uh, okay. I think that'll square that away, and it looks like everything is noted on the cards properly, so that sounds good. We'll grab a cup of coffee and let you stretch your feet out a little bit, and then we'll continue. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Just made some fresh stuff for you. Violent crime and the fear it provokes are crippling our society, limiting personal freedom, and fraying the ties that bind us. Now, those who commit repeated violent crimes should be told, when you commit a third violent crime, you will be put away and put away for good, three strikes, and you are out. I get caught with a gram of dope, 1.5 grams, okay? And I wasn't hurting anybody but myself. I wasn't selling it, you know? I didn't give it to kids or anything like that. And I go to court. They wasn't trying to hear anything. They, they used that three strikes law against me. And they gave me a 25-year sentence. I've been in a box just a little bit bigger than this for the last 17 years. And to be locked up and treated as I've been treated here, there's not a man alive that wouldn't feel the same way that I do now. They've created a ball of hate in me. Yeah, I'm in the penitentiary. But you know something? I've never, I've never been caught with anything. I got to get butt naked in front of females and these officers, and I got to bend over and show them my asshole. Yeah, humiliating it, it's beyond that. I had all, I had all of my mouth. I had those kicked out on the Robertson unit. I was beaten almost to death. They broke eight ribs. They dislocated my arms, my legs. They broke my jaw. They kicked out my grill. They broke my ocular bone, my nose. But you know something? The first time that I did get my head ripped off, three days later, it didn't hurt as bad. And then I, then, I, then I became a monster. I hate people. And do you know how sad that is to say? I, you know, I, I've been treated so bad back here that yes, I could. I could actually now, I could kill a man. You know, I, I really could. I could kill one of these laws. And, I'm, and, and that's sad. That's sad because, I, you know, 
I was raised, I was raised better than that. And what am I going to do now, Miss Round? When I get out, what am I going to do? Get me a job at McDonald's. I'll be 54 years old. Came down when I was 26. I was in college. I was taking a Votech. What am I, what am I going to do now? Because what you were before you come to the penitentiary is not what you're going to be when you are released. This is a country that began with the language of liberty, and yet we have more people in prison per capita than anybody in the world. There's no doubt that being rich makes it much less likely that you'll be incarcerated, uh, even if you've done something terrible. This is the richest year ever in human history. The rich are getting richer. It is evidence on our list. These are creators. They're not plutocrats. These are doers making things happen. And when they do well, we all do well. There's a religion that says everyone will benefit. That has almost nothing to do with the real world. So it completely fails in the real world. Uh, fails is the wrong word. It's not a failure for the, the, the fraction of 1% of the population that's accumulating wealth you know, beyond the dreams of avarice. The influence of money in politics has risen dramatically in recent decades. The people at the top have more money. What they've been doing is been giving bigger contributions to politicians and in return asking for lower tax rates on themselves and less stringent regulations on their companies. From humble beginnings in small town Arkansas to the world's leading retailer, Walmart has come a long way since 1962. No one, except for maybe Sam, who never lost sight of his original idea, could have predicted the company's remarkable growth. Walmart's an interesting case because Walmart has produced uh, a large number of hereditary billionaires. And they are, no doubt, highly respected in the communities in which they live, and no doubt they do respectable things. They, they fund museums and they give money to hospitals, and I'm sure they do all that stuff. And yet, you know, in many communities, people who work at Walmart are getting a wage, but also getting food stamps. So they're basically, the public is paying for Walmart's labor. For fiscal year ending 2012, Walmart had gross sales of like 446 billion, and then the net sales were 16.7, but almost 17 billion dollars net profit. I have no problem when a company making a profit. Like I said, I had my own business. But when you're making a profit at the expense of the people who are doing the work and they're, they're on food stamps, it's a moral issue. If you're making the decision, all right, we're gonna cut hours so we can keep profit up, you know what you're doing. We've been finding that wealthier individuals are more likely to perceive the pursuit of self-interest as opposed to collective interest as being moral and favorable. We're even observing this moralization of greed, this greed is good mentality. This culture absolutely selects for psychopathic thinkers, you know, people who literally have no empathy whatsoever. Because once you have successfully cleaved off ethical considerations, you're incredibly efficient. I think there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be comfortable. I don't even know that there's anything wrong with aspiring to be rich, but the aspiration of Wall Street is to have fuck you money. And, and fuck you money is the amount of money so vast that you could pick up the phone or say fuck you to whoever you wanted without repercussion. One of the necessary illusions for the general public is that we live in a capitalist economy. But the rich don't believe that for a minute. They insist on a powerful state to protect them from market discipline. So if Goldman Sachs makes a risky transaction, they're basically protected. If it crashes, they can run to the nanny state with their cap in hand and get bailed out. Good morning. This is a pivotal moment for America's economy. Problems that originated in the credit markets 
and first showed up in the area of subprime mortgages have spread throughout our financial system. It's been a dismal week on Wall Street. In the last five trading days, the Dow Jones has lost 1,400 points alone. Yesterday, the Dow closed down 500. Investors agree that this is a crucial week to see whether or not the government can step in and heal this economy. I'm a strong believer in free enterprise. Under normal circumstances, I believe companies that make bad decisions should be allowed to go out of business. But these are not normal circumstances. You know, the president has said over and over, it's the people's money. He's right about that. It is the people's money. But now it's the people's debt. This is a pain that will stay with me for the rest of my life. But you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? The spectacle of these bankers who have contributed hugely to bringing the Western economies to their knees and yet are still going on paying themselves money beyond the dreams of avarice in most people's eyes and they really think they're worth it. And sometimes I meet them socially and they say, Max, when will you understand this is how capitalism works? I say, this is not how capitalism works. This is how capitalism goes hopelessly, disastrously wrong. I'm the best person to speak on behalf of the Wall Street community because I sit across from them. You know, I, I see the humanity of people on Wall Street are working harder now than ever before, not knowing whether they could ever move up the ladder, and when will this rat race end for them? Dr. Alden Cass is a clinical psychologist, and probably more than anything else, uh, is known for helping people manage uncertainty and maintain optimal motivation and performance in times of uncertainty. Alden? All right, thanks. It's become a mission for me to help people out during this rough time because I feel like in my practice as a psychologist, my clients are looking to me for answers. My dissertation was the first study in the United States conducted in the last 50 years. It was called Casualties of Wall Street, an Assessment of the Walking Wounded. And my findings basically showed that we are currently in a crisis of connectivity. We should not bail out those who made the reckless decision to buy a home they knew they could never afford. That word came up a lot, oh, greedy homeowners. This is just about poor people who bought TVs on their second mortgages and it's their fault and they were greedy. That's the mentality, blame the victim. I kept using my credit cards to live, and then I finally got those where I was maxed out, and I'm at the end, and I'm fixing to be moving. I've got to go very soon, within the next few weeks. You know, I mean, you know, um, this, this, is, this is it, you know. There's a lot of data suggesting that social mobility is an all-time low. People, despite their hard work, aren't achieving the American dream. So who is it that achieves wealth? It's often those individuals that are born into wealth in the first place. I actually feel like I'm blessed with having everything I need. Could not be luckier. Could not ask for anything more right now. Oh, she's slimy.
at 15 years old, I left Big Stone Gap, Virginia, and I hitchhiked across this entire continent to Southern California. And I had a good time. I was young, heterosexual. <laughs> hey, life was good. I was thinking about going to Hollywood, being the next Tom Cruise or somebody, you know? I mean, but it didn't happen like that. My mom had a heart and lung infection, and she died in 89, and it crushed me. It crushed me. You know, I went into a spiral of doing wrong, spiral of doing things to get by, and it took me down a long road that I didn't want to travel, but I did. I was hanging out with the wrong people, doing the wrong things. Um, trying to make money, trying to, you know, survive, pretty much. I went to jail for about a year, and I came out and still couldn't get it straight. And then I had kids, and, and at that time, I couldn't have them with me because I was so wiped out. But after my congestive heart failure, I woke up. It was a wake-up call that I needed. It was a sorely needed wake-up call, and I did that. So I've been off to the races ever since. We just don't feel that mainstream school is a great place for kids who are even slightly above the curve. So we'll probably homeschool. If they're not staying on track, meeting the milestones, meeting the goals that they need to meet, it's gonna impact long-term what their outcome looks like. No challenge is more urgent. No debate is more important. We can either settle for a country where a shrinking number of people do really well, while a growing number of Americans barely get by. Or we can restore an economy where everyone gets a fair shot, and everyone does their fair share, and everyone plays by the same set of rules. It's not the case that inequality is attributable to bad apples but rather that the barrel is bad. The barrel is what's contaminating the apples. It's the institutions that prioritize getting ahead above all else, that it's okay to break the law if that means that you're gonna make more profits for the company with no attention to what the consequences are for the system as a whole. What I object to is the feeling that there's some mechanism out there about which you can do nothing at all. That's not simply not true. If humans want to change this, they can change it. We demand a raise! We demand a raise! What do we want? My name is Leah Taylor, and I'm here today to have a voice for my fellow workers and everybody that's struggling in the fast food industry. Rochelle Monty, what would you like to say to the boss of Allied Health for whom you work? I don't blame any one particular company. The truth is, unless the government actually acknowledge the importance of the home care sector within this country, people are going to continue to be failed. These problems are deep-rooted within the system, and it's the system that needs to change. My name is Janet Sparks, and I am a Walmart associate at store number 1102. When I think about the fact that our CEO, Mike Duke, made over $20 million last year, more than 1,000 times the average Walmart associate, with all due respect, I have to say, I don't think that's right.
I wish we'd never got into this state. I, I wish we'd never had these extraordinary high rewards. I didn't realize that that was going to happen. Maybe others always knew perfectly well that this would be the result of it. But I think that that is unfortunate and I, I regret it. I think, you know, you sort of always have it maybe in the back of your mind that you know you're not part of something good. But I didn't have a clear sense of I am doing something actively harmful. And then when the financial crisis hit, I started to feel really uncomfortable. And I asked my boss, will the public ever forgive us for this? And meaning the bailout. And he basically said to me, well, here's the thing. The public always forgets. The public forgot after the savings and loan crisis. The public forgot after long-term capital management blew up. The public always forgets. And the public will forget again. And we will, you know, move on. And it'll go back to normal. So don't worry about it. I've been sober for coming up for 11 months. That's the longest I've ever been away from a drink. And I've learned my margin for error is very small. I mean, I, if I pick up a drink, I'm right back to square one. You got to help me. I can't do it all by myself. You got to help me, baby. There's a push to have a secondary gate to keep these 10 to 20 homes completely separate from the rest of the homes that are already completely separate. I think it's a status thing more than a fear thing. There's already a guy at the gate, half of them with a gun. To be honest, I'd rather live in Florida. One of my next motivating factors is going to be the fact that I do want to eventually move to Florida and have a second home there. I won't have any regrets. I might be living under a bridge next week, you know, but at least I, I tried. If I could be a millionaire or anything like that and buy one big house that got about 50 bedrooms, you know, and have all my family with me, you know, I would love that. I would love that. If you don't help me, darling, I'll have to find myself somebody. I wish I didn't have to work so much. I wish I could see the kids a bit more. I wish Pietro and I could go out for dinner at night. I don't want much out of life. I just wish it was a bit easier. Hi. Most likely I'll end up back here. But it won't be because I walked into a school and shot up a whole bunch of children or rape somebody or anything like that. It'll be because I probably got caught stealing a loaf of bread and get a life sentence for it. Darling, I know where you sleep at, but I just feel like lying down.